game this week. If you were able last week to uh, hear the recorded message, we are starting a series walking through the Gospel of John. Over the last number of weeks, we've looked at a lot of thematic messages dealing with some of the feelings and issues that we've been experiencing. But I think it's always good for us to, to just stop and take a book from the Word of God and just go through it from beginning to end. Because while there's value in looking at thematic messages, there's great value in seeing the Word of God in its context. And oftentimes, it'll speak to each of us in a different way and will minister to each of us in ways that the speaker may not even have realized. So we are in the Gospel of John this morning. Last week, we looked at the first 18 verses, which is known as the prologue, the introduction to John's Gospel. And this morning, we are starting in chapter 1 at verse 19. So if you have a Bible or the electronic means to follow along without interrupting the video message, I would encourage you to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19. But before we get into it, let's take a moment and go to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that you are awesome and glorious today. We thank you that you are loving and merciful today. We thank you that you are holy and righteous today. We thank you that you are all these things and more today, and that you have not changed nor have you diminished, that your promises are still the same, that your plans have not faltered, that what you spoke always comes to pass in your perfect time. Lord, we depend on you and we rest in you today, as has already been shared earlier in the service, that we do not have to be worried or anxious, but we can bring our concerns to you, knowing that you hear us. Lord, we praise you for your body, the church made up of every person redeemed by the precious blood of Christ, every person who has believed on his name, part of this church. Lord, we thank you for the local expression of your church. And even though in these times we can't be sitting in the same room together, we are the church nonetheless. And because we are united by your spirit, distance does not have to separate us. Lord, we thank you for your spirit at work in us. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of opening up your word. And Lord, we thank you that your spirit can illuminate it for us when we seek him to. So Lord, we ask now that you would remove distractions from us. We ask that you would focus our attention on your word and that we would allow your word through your spirit to speak to our hearts. Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, minds to understand, and most of all, hearts to be changed for your glory in Jesus Christ. It is in his name we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the prologue, the beginning of the Gospel of John, John lays out what is going to be his focus in this book. As I mentioned last week of the four Gospels, John was written much later than the other three. And it was written, unlike the first three Gospels, that were written to be evangelistic in focus, first and foremost. That was not the case for the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John's first and primary audience was the church. Because John is moved by the Spirit to write to the church at a time when competing theologies and philosophies have crept into the church that are taking away the essential message of the gospel, that are diluting it, that are breaking it down. And one of the things that is under attack is who really is Jesus Christ? If he is indeed God, then he can't be man. And if he is indeed man, then he can't be God. And so John is moved by the Spirit in his old age, to say, I'm going to tell you the story of Jesus Christ again. 
And he begins it, as we mentioned last time, by going right back to the book of Genesis and saying, you want to know who Jesus is? Let me take you back to the beginning. So for all those believers who were Jewish, they knew immediately the reference that he was making when he said, in the beginning was the word. And then he lays out this beautiful picture of who Jesus is. And he uses descriptors like word, the logos. He calls him God. He calls him creator. He calls him the light. He calls him the only begotten. And after John lays out this introduction, he says, okay, this is what I want you to understand. This is where I'm coming from. It's like laying out your bias before you give a presentation. He said, I want you to know, I believe that Jesus Christ is God. And everything that's going to come from here is with that understanding. So after he's done that introduction, now he gets into the story, the narrative. So starting at verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. And we met John, the baptizer, earlier in the prologue. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? So John has been going around preaching a gospel of repentance, preaching a message saying the Messiah is coming, and you need to prepare yourself for this. And so everybody wants to know, well, who are you? Are you Elijah? Because there was a prophecy of an Elijah who would come and make the way for the Messiah. Are you the Messiah? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? No. And then John replies in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. And for those Jewish hearers, particularly for the scribes and the Pharisees, they know exactly what he's referring to. They know exactly the passage in Isaiah the promise that the Messiah is coming, and one will come as his herald. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This reference here, the statement by John, of course, goes back to the prologue, where the writer says that the word came into the world and they didn't know him. He came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. And John is saying, look, he's here right now. The Messiah is here right now. And you don't know it. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, this is a pretty big statement. For, again, his Jewish audience, this is huge because they know the references. When you say the Lamb of God, that goes back to the atonement. That goes back to the Passover. And then to say who takes away the sin of the world, those words are blasphemy if they're not true. So John is a pretty gutsy fellow in this moment, obviously led by the Spirit, when he stands in front of the multitudes and says, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because you see, John, as he's writing this, John the Apostle, he is not trying to gently and delicately get to the crux of the matter. He's saying, look, this is what was said right from the beginning. 
when John the Baptist saw Jesus come, he didn't say, oh, here's a good teacher. It would be interesting to see what comes of this. He says, look, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, do not, did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, making reference to the moment when Jesus was baptized by John, which we're assuming in this text occurred earlier than this moment that he's talking right now to the people around him. As it's mentioned in one of the other Gospels about Jesus being baptized and the dove descending upon him. He said, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Now, this is important when we look at this because to have the Spirit descend upon Christ and remain with him is profound. When we go all the way through the Old Testament, we often hear of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone in order to do a task. So the Holy Spirit came upon David at certain times. The Holy Spirit came upon Moses. The Holy Spirit came upon Elijah. The Holy Spirit came upon Elisha. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul. But the Holy Spirit never remains with them. He comes upon them for a purpose, but he doesn't remain with them. Why? Because the Holy Spirit cannot indwell and remain where sin is present. So for the Holy Spirit of God to visibly, in a fashion, descend upon Jesus and remain with him, is John saying, this man is sinless. There is nothing that hampers his fellowship with the Father. There is nothing that limits his relationship with God, because the Spirit can come upon him and remain with him. This is important because John is, wants to establish how Jesus can be who he says he is and do what he's going to do, which is to die for the sins of the world. See, Jesus has to be perfect. And if the Holy Spirit has descended upon him and remained with him, this is one of the ways it testifies his perfection, because the Spirit is able to dwell with him. Now, there's a, a neat Thing which you may have heard uh, over the years that was told through the centuries, a, a beautiful picture, and take it as a picture for what it's worth. We go back to Genesis and we come to the account of the flood. You may recall as the flood is nearing its end, we have the scene where Noah opens the little shuttered window and he sends a raven out to see what the conditions are outside. And then he takes a dove and he sends the dove out. And the dove goes and then it comes back. It has no place to rest, we're told. Then he waits a while and he sends the dove out again. And the dove goes and this time the dove comes back and he brings a little olive branch, which is a picture of peace. Then he sends the dove out again after a period of time and it says the dove goes and it does not return. And for the early church, they drew this picture, said for through the centuries, the dove being a picture of the Spirit has been traveling through looking for the one where he could rest. 
and now by the river Jordan near Bethany, the dove comes and he rests and he remains. Because finally, in the whole scope of human history, there is one worthy for the spirit to rest on. I always loved that picture. So now we have this introduction. John the Baptist has explained again who Jesus is, and he's used several names now. He's called him the Lamb of God. He's called him the Son of God, both of which they're either true or they're blasphemy. They're either true or somebody should be dying for saying those things right now. This is important when we live in an age where people will say, well, Jesus was a great teacher, a good philosopher, a nice role model. It's important to realize that the people who walked with Jesus, who wrote with Jesus, were not that limiting. The Apostle John didn't think Jesus was just a good teacher when he wrote this epistle. In his gospel words, he's saying, you need to understand. John the Baptist thought he was the Lamb of God. John the Baptist thought he was the son of God. So, and Jesus didn't say, no, sorry, I'm not. He didn't. Then we come to the next verse. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When they saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? And this is something we see all through the Gospels. Jesus loves to ask questions, just like God the Father loves to ask questions. You go back to Genesis, we see in the Genesis account over and over again where God poses questions. Why? Because he needs to know the answer? No, God is omniscient. He knows the answer. He asks questions because questions serve to help the person understand their own actions and motives. So Jesus turns to these two disciples who are now walking behind him, and he goes, uh, what do you want? Because he wants them to think about what it is they're doing. Because walking along with Jesus means something. This is important for us, too. Jesus asks us this question. When we say, oh, I'm a follower of Christ, he asks, well, wh what do you want? Why are you here? Are you here because you're looking to get something from me? Is there a problem in your life you're hoping to get sorted out? Are you concerned about the hereafter and you want some fire insurance? What do you want? He wants us to consider that question. They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where, where are you staying? And then Jesus gives his statement, which often comes, we see in the Gospels. Come, he replied, and you will see. And this is something that also is a powerful message of the Gospel. Oftentimes, we come to Jesus and we like, Jesus, I want you to, can you fix this? And can you change this? And can you do this? What's it going to look like for the next 20 years? Is this going to be an easy road or is it going to be a hard road? I need to know. I've got to make some decisions here. So what can you tell me? And Jesus always says to us, come and you'll see. Never, I'll show you, then you come. It's no you have me come and then you'll see as you get to know me how i will work out things in all the spheres of your life for my glory come and then you'll see so they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him it was about the 10th hour and they were told who one of these two disciples of John's were. One, we assume, is the author of the book, the Apostle John. The other is Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did 
was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. In the early church and continuing to this day in many parts of the world, the legitimacy of a profession of faith is determined by the willingness to share it. Andrew saw something in Jesus that was significant enough to him, even in that early moment, that he had to go to the person who mattered in his life and share it with him. In Pakistan, where the church is just exploding in areas where persecution is rampant, one of the tests of someone who comes and profess faith in Christ to believers, the first thing that they are told is, you must go now and tell your family. And that can be a pretty scary thing if you're in a fundamentalist Muslim region. But that's what they're told. If you have sincerely come to Christ, if this has really transformed you, if this is what you sincerely believe, then you know you have to share it with somebody else. You have to. And this is what we see with Andrew. Just to put in a personal story, when our first child was born and we were deciding on names, we decided to call him Andrew. And our prayer was, Lord, we want him to be a person who goes and tells other people. And then later on, we had our second son, Jonathan. And when Andrew was in Awana Cubbies, one of his activities was he had to, he had learned the basic steps of the gospel. And he was supposed to go to a parent or to one of his cubby leaders and tell them what are the steps of the gospel. And so when we came to that section in his little cubby book, we said, okay, Andrew, you can, you can tell mommy or you can tell daddy. Just tell us what the gospel is about. And Andrew, as a preschooler, struck and convicted us both when he said, but mommy and daddy, you both know about the gospel. Jonathan doesn't know yet. So he sat down with his little toddler brother and he explained the gospel to him. This is what we are called to do. We are called to be Andrews. If Jesus is all that John is going to show him to be, and we've encountered him, it is not possible for us, if we're dependent on the Spirit to give us the strength, it's not possible for us to keep it to ourselves. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. And there's another beautiful picture. There's so much in this first part about how the gospel works. We have those who see Jesus and come to him. We have those who go and tell others and bring them to Jesus. But we also have these ones that Jesus actively finds. And when we come to Philip here, where it says Jesus found him. Jesus didn't pass by. Jesus found him and brings Philip to him. And then we see what Philip does. Philip encounters Jesus, and what does he do? Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also spoke, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip goes and tells somebody. From what little he's encountered with Jesus, he sees enough to know this guy is what we've been looking for as a Jewish nation. And it's funny because John gives us a very honest thing, which is, again, one of the beautiful things about the gospel, is that these gospel stories aren't constructed, whitewashed to make everything look good. 
Because what do we see here? We have Nathaniel's response. Can anything good come out of there? Nathaniel asked. Thinking of Nazareth, which culturally at the time, Nazareth was considered the low end of the Jewish community. It was considered close to a lot of Gentile cities. It was considered influenced by Gentile culture. It was a blue collar area. It was generally, you know, you could think about it in your own region, that part of the city where people go, eh, not so much. And so Nathaniel, he's just being straight up. He's like, really? The Messiah, the answer to the law and the prophets, and he came from Nazareth. <sighs> Don't think so. Not meeting expectations. And we have that. There are times where we can start to present the gospel and somebody's like, really? That doesn't seem too impressive to me. Where are the bells and whistles? But you see what Philip does. Come and see. You want to know how my Jesus measures up? Come and see. Meet him for yourself. And oftentimes we try to defend who Christ is, his nature and his promises, and we're not called to defend it. We're called to simply present it, to share it. The Lord Jesus for Christ can defend himself. He can do that very well. So we see here, Nathanael comes. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. And Jesus, it seems like he's taking a bit of a shot at him, but he's actually making a complimentary statement, saying, Here's a guy who knows his Jewish history, he knows his culture, he knows his expectations. This is it. He's looking at it and going, okay, Nazareth doesn't measure up. I don't know who this guy can be. He's not going to just jump on any bandwagon. Of course, this kind of freaks out Nathaniel when Jesus starts talking to him like he knows him. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Now we can read over that, but we need to recognize again, John the Apostle, as he's writing this account, is showing the divinity of Christ. So for Jesus to say, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you, is actually a statement of omnipresence. I was there where you were. And omniscience, I knew what you were thinking about. I knew your conversation. I knew this. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. We see a wild change here with Nathanael from, can anything good come from Nazareth? I mean, really, I've not even seen this guy as having any value at all to suddenly making this bold statement of faith. You are the son of God. You are the king of Israel, which again is either true or it's blasphemy. There's no middle ground here. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You shall see greater things than that. And this reference here is setting us up for the next part of the book. Because through the next chapters, from 2 to the end of chapter 12, John is going to display seven great signs of the power and divinity of Christ. So as he's speaking to Nathaniel, the author is also preparing us, the readers and the listeners, to say, get ready, because I'm going to show you seven signs that show you who Jesus Christ is. Then he added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. 
And this picture here of the opening of heaven is also significant because it ties back to Old Testament prophecy and the idea that the connection would be open between humanity and God again, that fellowship would be available for man and God. And John's saying, this is what's coming. Follow along with the story because this is what's coming. You will see the heavens open and the angels of God descending and ascending on the Son of Man. So what can we take from this? What are our points to draw from it? Well, it's important, of course, to notice. We see Jesus as the Lamb of God. He's the Son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the King of Israel. He's the Son of God. We see that when Jesus, when someone comes to Jesus, Jesus will ask them the question, what do you want? Because he wants the person to ask themselves that question. Why are you coming to Jesus? Are you coming because you need a Savior? Are you coming because you need to have your sins forgiven? Are you coming just because you're looking for a good meal or a social connection? When Jesus calls us, he calls us to come first in faith. And then we see how he reorders and transforms our lives. But there is no, there is no test case. There is not one of those per periods where, well, I've got 30 days to try this out and then I can decide. No, no. You come first by faith. And as we come and encounter Christ and begin to experience him, the natural reaction of that is we have to tell someone. Andrew tells Peter. Philip tells Nathaniel. They have to tell someone. And it's not a legalistic, you must do this. It's, I can't believe I've met this man. He fulfills the promises. He fulfills the law. He's what's been prophesied. I need to tell someone. And for you and I, if we have seen our lives transformed, if we know what it means to go from darkness to light, from death to life, to not be a people, to suddenly become the people of God, if we really think on that and let the Spirit impress that on us, then we have to tell somebody. It's too good to keep it to ourselves. We have to tell two friends. We have to tell somebody. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of Israel. He is the one who will provide a way so that the heavens can be opened. And so there can be fellowship between God and humanity again. So what I would encourage you this week as you meditate on this passage, as you read it over again, to think on that. I also would encourage you to dwell on who could be your person to talk to this week. You don't have to convince them. You're just inviting them. The Spirit does the work. Remember, as I said, we don't defend Jesus Christ. The Lord of glory defends himself. He's done it for 2,000 years. He continues to do it now. He was able to redeem you, able to redeem me. He's able to redeem others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ is indeed the Lamb of God who did take away the sin of the world. Lord, we thank you that he is the Son of God and the Son of Man, perfect in his divinity, perfect in his humanity, that the Holy Spirit could rest and indwell in him, for there was nothing that prevented his fellowship with the Spirit. And because of his finished work, the Spirit can indwell us as the seal of our inheritance. Lord, we praise you that those who follow Jesus find him. 
Lord, we praise you that Jesus invites people to follow him, finds those, and brings them to himself. Lord, we noticed even in this account that Jesus didn't cast away any of the people who came to him. Each in their own situation, he questioned them, but he didn't cast them away. Lord, we thank you that he didn't cast us away. That those here who know him, who've experienced his salvation, he says to us that he will never cast us out. Lord, move in us this week to think of the person that we could invite to Jesus. Knowing that the responsibility to persuade is not ours. You tell us simply to be ready to give a reasonable answer for the hope that lies within us. Lord, move us this week to share it with someone. For your glory in Jesus Christ. Amen.